Hey, girls, up in the uh, big room. I just went and visited them. Kind of shocked them. They were all kicked back. <laughs> it's funny. You know, like working on stuff and coloring in books. <laughs> I'm like, hey, I'm going to teach from here. I wonder if I could just hold my cell phone up and they could, you know, beam it in here. <laughs> I'm kicking back with the, the babes upstairs. <laughs> I love it. I mean, I think it's great. Well, how many got blown away on the ocean today? Was it fun? Yeah. You know, the stuff that we do, you know, sometimes we're afraid to do it. And I just think, you know, why? Why why should we be afraid? You might get hurt, but, you know. I get hurt anyway. <laughs> I mean, you know, I didn't do anything to get hurt. It was a, a, a year on the sofa, so uh, I saw a lot of good old movies, though. Uh, that's what my dogs watch when I'm away. I put it on the old movie channel. They seem to be more in touch with themselves now. <laughs> Our discussions are much deeper. Uh, you never know how funny your dogs are. Until, you know, you start talking to them. (laughs) Well, let's jump right back into Daniel. We got some stuff to cover tonight. Um, Where we left them, uh, well, they say they put up here. Is it, it's on the seat or up here? The clicker? <laughs> they were so cool. They said, we already have it up there for you tonight. So I couldn't like mess it up before I got up here. <laughs> While they're doing that, I'll tell you a story. Oh, thanks. Well, while he's taking care of that, um, you know, I was telling you about in my own life, uh, I just didn't know what, you know, God wanted and being out of, of booking, in a, you know, for a year and, thank you. Um, <laughs> I, I just, you know, I just didn't know. I, I mean, you know, there's sometimes in your life where it's just clicking and, and it's to, to, to the next thing, to the next thing, to the next thing and, you know, you wish you didn't have all that stuff or, you know, you look at your calendar and it's stretching out for, you know, two years. And I love it when people try to book me, which that normally you do two years in advance. And I always laugh when they call and they say, Are, you know, you available for, you know, so-and-so and in 2018. I'm like, I don't even know if I'll be in my right mind in so-and-so 2018. <laughs> but sure, send me a deposit. I'll be glad to put it on the calendar. <laughs> you take your chances. <laughs> I mean, I always thought that was funny, but I guess that's the way people live, um, you know, that far out in advance. And um, so I had been praying and, and I, you know, having a doctorate in English, I, I don't know that if you went on and, and I don't even know if my bio is anywhere. I'm probably incognito, uh, the substitute teacher. Um, but born in Alabama, um, my dad's a retired Southern Baptist preacher, um, Went to college at Sanford University in, in Birmingham. Academic, ap- academic excellence in a Christian environment is the motto, and they just locked us up at night is basically <laughs> what they do. But I was a cow, and we could slip out the cow window. This screen is still not up, guys. The one I'm supposed to look at. That might be bad. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I can go with it. <laughs> Just don't know what we'll come up with. And um, then I got, I started teaching school. It was the furthest thing from my mind to teach school. Thank you. And um, I started teaching seventh grade English, which is the closest thing to purgatory Baptists can get. (laughs) And um, it's really closer to hell, but you can't say that out loud. Uh, 
I mean, it, it, if you're not prepared, I was teaching like, a, you know, English, 12th grade English at a really, you know, good high school doing my, um, whatever you call it, my teacher's thing before you, they let you go out and teach. What do you call it? Student Thank teaching. you. Student teaching. And, um, <laughs> yeah, just keep giving me the answers. I don't really... <laughs> that just shows you I'm not coming to impress you. <laughs> I'm way beyond that. <laughs> you know, somebody came up and said, thank you so much for your honesty and just being where you are. And I went, you would see through it very quickly if I tried anything else. <laughs> I mean, you'd be checking that box. Uh, but I just, I mean, I, I couldn't, I didn't know what to do with these kids. Um, I, you know, planned like two weeks of, of, of lesson prep and, and I was finished with it in 15 minutes, <laughs> you know. And, and you were like, whoa. They're still here, and uh, <laughs> they, they just won't sit quietly at their seats. <laughs> and uh, so uh, began to, in, in that, God began to woo me to himself and began to show me about his love. And um, he allowed me to see, and I didn't know it was God. I mean, I was just like the rest of the kids at a Christian school. We didn't really know what was going on. And... Um, <laughs> I mean, we would, my sorority sisters and I, once a semester, we'd get together and they'd all, we'd all bring our brand look, new looking Bibles because we just didn't use it because we had intro to Old Testament the first semester of freshman, and then second semester you had the intro to you know, New Testament, well, then you're finished with your Bible. And, and so um, <laughs> we would come in and everyone would give their favorite verse, and, and then we'd kind of look around the room and... We didn't know any more each semester, you know, what to say about the Lord than the last semester because we were just doing the best we could. I mean, it's really kind of pitiful when I talk about it. And so I was the editor of the newspaper at the college, and um, the last semester I was um, given some tickets to The Hiding Place, uh, the, the movie about Corey Tinboom. And they, you can see this now. I think it's on DVD um, if you have not seen that or if you've not read the book, The Hiding Place, uh, actually, The Hiding Place is the Hollywood, vi- Hollywood version of her book called A Prisoner and Yet. A Prisoner and Yet was written pretty much not too long after she was out. And it's a, it's a lot bumpier. It's a lot uh, more, you know, it's not as smooth, but it's just the stories. And, and I find it a lot um, better, if you will, as far as just Corey, you know, telling her stuff. So a prisoner, and yet you probably can find it in used bookstores. I just, I love going into used bookstores and just buying up all these old books that nobody cares about. Um, And so I went to see The Hiding Place, and nobody would go with me because it was a Christian movie. And um, I was blown away. I had no idea, you know, her story. I had no idea about the Ten Moons. I had no idea, really, about Christians helping Jews and going to concentration camps and and how horrible it was, and uh, I, I was just, I had never been, if you will, in the presence of someone on the screen who trusted God, like Corey and her sister, especially her sister, Betsy, and, and how she, she said, I, I didn't forget this, you know, Corey, when we leave here, people will listen to us because we've been in hell, and we will say, no pit is so deep that God is not deeper still. See, you don't know that. You can't say that unless you have been in the deeper pit. It only comes from experience. You can read books. You can see things. I just didn't know what God had in store for me. And we're going to read a a, a verse from Acts uh, in the morning about Paul where God is saying, you know, leave him alone because he's going to have to go through a lot to be my messenger. And and I I just think sometimes... um, you know, there's honesty in, in, in when your vocation is difficult. There's an honestness that comes when saying you may lose your life in, in fulfilling this. And, uh, you know, sometimes I think that would be good in marriages, you know, when you stand up there and say, this is going to be the hardest thing you've ever done. Do you really want to do this? There's still time. You know, because have you noticed at weddings, you have to say something. They just don't take. When they go, will you take this man to be your husband, you just can't go, hmm? <laughs> you know, they don't look at each other and go, well, eh, well. 
mean, they make you say, I will, I do, I'll try, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll. And, and, you know, there's something about that. And, and when you study the Jewish tradition, when we eat the cake with them, we are entering into covenant with them symbolically because it has salt in the cake. That's the reason you have that cake there. And when they feed the cake to one another, it is one of the covenant ceremonies, uh, steps that says, now we are one. You are as me and I'm as you because we're taking each other into each other like we do the communion. If you've never studied the covenant ceremony and the covenant steps, K. Arthur has a great study on that. It will open your eyes to Jewish tradition, what things really mean, how God is so consistent in his word. He's not American. (laughs) (laughs) Who would know? And, and when you begin to see those things, you know, books like Daniel begin to pop up. And, 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 and like when Jesus died right at 3 o'clock, right at 3 o'clock was when the, the, the priest would give the second sacrifice of the day for the... Uh, uh, I'm a little tired tonight. I'm sorry, so I'm having a little trouble bringing stuff out. But for the, the nation of Israel. And there would be a priest on top of the... Uh, uh, okay, Lord. You're just going to have to bring it all back to me. On top of the, uh, the, the synagogue, okay? And they would watch as the sundial would come, and when it got right at 3 o'clock, they would blow a horn, blow a shofar. And, and the lamb, the unblemished lamb, would be cut right at that moment, slain for the sins of the nation of Israel. When Jesus said, it is finished, the ram blew. And, and every moment... That you were, you heard, when at, at the moment you heard that, everyone in Jerusalem stopped when they heard the, the horn blow. Because all the Jews knew that was the sacrifice of the lamb for us. So see, if you never knew that, it, you would go, well, he died at three. I don't know why we have all these times. Have you ever wondered that? What, what's the, I mean, not, not to be, you know, irreligious or anything, but what's the big deal about knowing he died at three? It's a big deal. And so when we're thinking about how God leads us, things are big deals. But if I'm not watching, if I'm not stopping and saying, Lord, will you point stuff out to me? Uh, my friends who, who you know, laugh at me because I'm a, a doctor in English, they're like, of course you like to write. Don't tell me to journal. And I'm like, I don't like journaling either. I thought it was like Dear Diary. You know, every year you get the diary at Christmas. Did y'all used to do that? First six days, you'd write in it. The seventh, January 7th, it'd be the same. Look at last day. Look at yesterday. Look at. I hated it. I mean, I didn't want. What? You know, it's so boring. All right. But that's not what you're doing. You're not, not, not just writing down everything you do. You're writing down what occurs to you, what's happened in that day, what you've observed. And, and it, it has, um, uh, an, it, it, it's an event inside of you. I mean, it's not just like ruminating over it. It's, it's an event that happens. It actually, something occurs inside of you because you are conversing with God. And your mind will go, check the box, check the box. It's like, yeah, we got it. And it's stored back there. I mean, things that we don't even realize are going on. That's how smart God is when he put this in our head. I mean, I can just see him when he puts it in mind. He says, now, she's not going to know how to use it. But he directs. So I've been praying, you know, Lord, what do I do? What do I do? And people have been saying, oh, you need to teach. And I'm like, look, I'm 61. No college is really going to, you know, hire me on a tenure track course because I'm 61. They're going to hire somebody young who's, you know, got lots of time. And, you know, maybe doesn't have as much wrong with her. (laughs) I would not make it, you know. Survivor, I wouldn't even get on the island. (laughs) Today, the survivor people all jumped in the water and one woman died. (laughs) Like, go, Rose. Aww. (laughs) Isn't that funny you think about it? I could do that. No. (laughs) So um, I decided about a month and a half ago, I was just sitting at my my you know, art easel, and I, 
I, I just said, I just feel like I'm supposed to get my transcripts. That's about like my saying, I'm going to go raise pigs or something. I mean, it's just so far from what I'd been thinking about doing. And, and so I called and went through the process of trying to get transcripts. And, and then I downloaded some um, applications to community college or some of the colleges in the area. And, and I just, I never turned them in because I'm like, I know that I was supposed to do that. It was that, that strong. You ever get up sometimes and it's just in your gut. And you're like, you could do other things, but you're supposed to be doing that. Yeah, sure, you can go to Dairy Queen, but you're supposed to be doing this. <laughs> and so I did, and, and I've just been praying about it. And people ask, and I'm like, you know, I'm just praying. I'm seeing what God's doing. I'm getting my stuff together. Well, one, one day through the website, I have a website, RoseanneColeman.com. It's R-O-S-E-A-N-N-E-C-O-L-E-M-A-N.com. And um, you can go on that and, you know, send me an email I'm on Facebook. There's a like page, and there's also a friend page. You're welcome to do either one of those. Um, and I got a, an email through the, the, the website, and it was from a gentleman who is a dean of students over in Chattanooga, which is about two hours from my house. And um, he said, your name was given to us uh, by, and he mentioned the name. And it was so funny because I dated this guy in my doctoral work. <laughs> This name that he gave me, and I'm like, for what? He gave you my name for what? <laughs> He's a jerk, you know what? I, I... <laughs> He's really not, but you know when you date. It, it... And um, I haven't seen him, you know, since like 92. And it's like, I mean, what a blast from the past. It was like, God, dated? Recommend me? And, um, and he said, we have a class, it's adult learners, and it'll be on Monday nights from, from uh, 6 to 10, which is a tremendously long time for undergraduates. It's long for graduate students, uh, but, and it's only going to be for five Monday nights. And what they would pay, I would actually pay more in driving and having to stay the night than coming back. I'll, I'll lose money to take the job, to take the, it's called an adjunct position, just one class. But the class intrigued me because he said, what we want you to do is to teach the second part of world literature. And then you take this other book um, by a man named Veith, I think, V-I-V-E-I-T-H, um, Christian writer. And you're to take how the Christian worldview, you know, was in the writing and then how it began to separate as, as the time went on in literature. And I, it was just so fascinating because I'm a 19th century American literature. That was what my proficiency was in, what I took my exams in. And then my dissertation was about teaching student-teacher conferencing, teaching writing that way where you met with the kids every week. You just didn't do classwork. And the, that was the title of my dissertation, student teacher conferencing, showing the pigeons in the magician's sleeves. And because and I realized there were things that you could do to teach about writing. There are things I can teach you. But there's that part where it, you know, it comes down to the individual. And it's the same thing with your walk with Jesus. It comes down to who you are and where you are and what's going on inside of you and what God does with you. And, and so um, I said, well, gosh, you know, give me... 24 hours to pray about it. And so I, I wrote him back and I said, I cannot find a reason not to do this. Everything says no, but the topic intrigues me. Well, then I got the textbook. You know, the textbook's this. I mean, this is like a week from this Monday we start. And um, so funny thing is out of the blue, from a guy I dated in 92, what rhymes, <laughs> where we said probably no one would call me, God said, just wait. And then when the call comes in, I'm going, should I do it? See, there's still that question of, is this from him? But going back into the academic world, what I've been doing for 31 years and teaching the Bible since 1985, like this, is I've been bringing all my reading and all the stuff that I've, from that world, you know, I try to bring into this world. 
and see where that merges and see where we come together. So now it's going to be interesting to go the other way. And I was thinking about Daniel this afternoon. If Daniel had not been taken from his country and put into this program, he probably would have not been the man and in the position that he would have been in that he was with the Chaldeans. Do you understand that? He would not have been over a pagan nation. He, you know, when it comes up and he's number three over a pagan nation, God's man. See, so sometimes when God shuts you off from something and, and you're, you know, you're gushing from this, you know, from the trauma of it and you're just like, oh my gosh, how could he do that? And it's just a terrible tragedy. But then things begin to work and you begin to meet people and you begin to see people because if your eyes are always like, hey, who are you? Instead of look at me. You know, trying to say, what does God have planned? And when we see Daniel's pressure, I now I know where I got confused because I thought I had transferred the, the, the um, scriptures on there. So if you have your Bibles, you know, turn to chapter 2. And I want us to look at, the, at, at verse 14. And this is in the New American Standard. I like the New American Standard because it still uses the word behold. Those of you who have heard me before know I love that word, behold. And, um, you know, the rest of them kind of leave it out. And I don't know how you have a Bible without the word behold. I, I mean, really, you know, what are the, the angels going to say to the shepherds? Hey, hey, Jesus is born. It's not the same thing. You know, behold, behold. The word behold is a verb. It's, it, it, it's, you know, you behold something. It actually means not just looking at something, but when you behold something, you study it. You take part of it into yourself. You know, hey, stop, look and listen. This is important. Bring it in to yourself. We need to bring it back into our vernacular. Hey, behold, there's a 7-Eleven. Let's get a soda. I mean, <laughs> behold. And I said one time, even here I said, what will our Christmas decorations look like? Hey, hey, Jesus is born. <laughs> and I got something in the mail right before Christmas that year. And a kid had taken, uh, um, Stephanie had taken a, a Christmas ball and written on there, hey, hey, Jesus is born. <laughs> I hang it on my tree every year. But in the New American Standard there in chapter 2, when, when the degree, the, the, the decree goes out and, and they're gonna, all, they're gonna kill all the wise men and they come looking for Daniel and his friends. Verse 13, the last word, verse, words here for me are to kill them. Who's there? Land shark. No, sorry. You know, who's there? It's the king's men. Why are you here? We're gonna kill you. Open the door. You, you watched Saturday Night Live, huh? <laughs> Caught you off guard. You need some water? <laughs> you remember those skits? Y'all are too young, aren't you? <laughs> and, and here, verse 14... It says, then Daniel replied in the New American Standard, it says, with discernment and discretion. What, what do some of your versions have there? He replied with what? Wisdom and tact. You know, in the church, we just leave those behind a lot, don't we? Or with people we have a, a disagreement with. You know, how often, I mean, these guys are coming to kill him, and he replies with wisdom and tact. Now, that just didn't come to him in that moment. What are you doing? It's, it's muscle memory, isn't it? When the things come against you, you're remembering God is in charge. And you're going to, you know, what do I do, Lord? And you got to act that quickly. You don't go, oh, wait a minute. Let me go get in my prayer closet. <laughs> Give me 15 minutes. <laughs> no. And I, I've got that underlined in my Bible. And I thought, oh, Father, help me to respond with discernment. And, and, and discretion with wisdom. And what's the other word? Tact. Is there any other words in, in your different translations? Prudence. We hardly ever hear that word anymore. Kids used to be named prudence, didn't they? Maybe some of you here are named prudence. 
It's good I was not named Prudence. Um, <laughs> and, and so he answered the king, and he asked, you know, why are you here? And so he told him. And look in verse 16. So Daniel went in and requested of the king that he would give him time. Esther did the same thing, didn't she? She requested time of the king so she could go and talk to them. We need to realize, now I'm not up here trying to give you some way to how to do business or how to do relationships, but I'm saying we're, we're seeing some pretty solid stuff here. If you're having some problems in some situations, you need to be praying that God gives you these kinds of responses. If it worked for Daniel in the front of a pagan king, it'll, it'll work for you and your boss. Are the people that you're having problems with. Or in your churches, you know, there's just a lot of stuff that goes in churches. And it just, you know, it's, it's like a, um, a sweater when it starts getting those little poly things on it, you know. And, and you, something needs to be picked off all the time. And, and we need to be going to the Lord and saying, how do you, how do you, I want to do this. You, you did it for Daniel. Please do it for me. Pray that over your kids. Look, I don't have any kids, but every time I get close to a kid, I pray over them. I mean, I do. When I see little ones, I'll say, may I, may I touch your baby? I want to pray a blessing. And I just make the sign of the cross on the little forehead and I just pray for him because I know that kid's eyes are going to see things I will never see. He came in my path. I was able to give him some blessing. I was able to give him a little what God has given me. I'm not a holy woman in that way, but I know that I can give a gift and pray over him, lay hands on the little one. And here he says... You know, what are you, what are you doing? And he says, give me time. Give me time so I can ask. Now, there's a relationship here that the king already knows these guys have set themselves apart. You know, from the get-go in your job, if you've not done it before, whenever you start something new or if you're there now, you need to establish that you love Jesus. It may be kind of strange but you don't have to say i am a christian praise god i'm just gonna pray over us every morning and you don't have to do that you can i mean that's an option <laughs> but when i started teaching at my second school you know somebody gave me that advice you know do it early so on my desk i had little little things because kids when they come to your desk pick up everything off your desk you know they throw it up in there you know Oh, I broke it. I'm sorry. You know, they'll take it back to their desk. You know, so I always have my Bible out on my desk, and and I didn't make a deal out of it. But you know, you had stuff, and I I just tried early, and it, it was a little funny. You know, when I sat down in the teacher's lounge, you know, to say, guess what I read this morning in Streams in the Desert, and there were a few other Christians in there, and so we were able to kind of talk about it, but not in an affected way. But I felt nervous. I mean, it wasn't like I was like, oh, I feel like Billy Graham, you know. The buses will wait. Oh, no, they don't. We want the kids to leave. Um, but so I had a gentleman come in. He was, the, he was in charge of maintenance, and I had been warned about him that he was a little crafty. You know, I was just 23 at that time. And so he comes into my room, and he sits down on the garbage can right by, on top of the garbage can right by my desk. So he's kind of eye level. And he's like, looks at the stuff on my desk, he says, Miss Coleman, are you a Jesus freak? And I looked at my stuff, and I looked at him, and I went, you know, I think I am. (laughs) Wow, yeah, yeah, I guess I'm a Jesus freak. And he said, well, it's good to meet you. And he got up, and he left. (laughs) I didn't ever have any trouble out of him. You know what I'm saying? It's just easier, and it goes both ways. I was, I was ostracized because of it, and I was embraced because of it. But we have to be who we are. And I told my kids, if I ever get engaged, you will hear about the guy. You will know stuff about him. You will help me do the envelopes. You will, you will come. You'll, you'll do skits at the, the parties and you know, all this kind of stuff. I said, so don't be surprised if I talk about Jesus because he's the most important thing in my life. I'm not trying to get you to believe in him, but he's just going to be part of what I say. That's just how it goes. And let me know if that bothers you. And I would start my classes with, now I'm going to pray for y'all. Y'all don't have to pray. I'm just going to pray out loud in front of you. And, and I'm going to devote myself to the highest authority in my life. 
And I would say, Jesus, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for these kids. You've had me praying for them all summer. Now that I see them, I know why. <laughs> and, and they would laugh. And they would go, oh. <laughs> and I would say, I just commit myself to you. You're higher than my principal, my superintendent. You're the highest authority. I pray that I'll be fair. I'll pray that I'll be interesting. I'll pray that I'll know when I should apologize. I pray that I will be a person of integrity and honor with these kids. Thank you that you've given us this time to be together. And I, I hope we do well. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, get out your book cards. And, and there will be kids just like, <laughs> wow. Uh, but you don't make a deal out of it. Now, I might not be able to do that. In a, in a public school today. When I was in my doctoral work, if you were a witch, um, yeah, if you were a witch, or, or uh, believed in aliens, or other things, you could talk about that in class, you could, you could have seminars, you could have the kids over to your house, but if you talked about Christ, then you were ostracized. So somewhere in there, now that God's pulled me back into the university, but it is a Christian university, there will still be things that I might be too liberal for them. You know, it's going to go the other way. Like, you're a crackpot, Dr. Coleman. You know, whatever the deal is, is we've got to come and say, what does God want us to do? May we be women of discernment. But try to be who you are. It's your life. Be in that. Ask God for those gifts. And if you're 80 years old, it's not too late. He's got plenty for you to do or you'll be dead. What does it say about David? And when he had accomplished the will of God in his lifetime, he fell asleep. When he accomplished the will of God in his generation, I think is what the scripture says. When he had done the will of God in his generation, he fell asleep. We got stuff to do. And we see that here in Daniel. And what does he do? And on the thing it says, would we do the same thing? Or we would go home and we'd just panic. He's going to kill me. He's going to kill me. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. What should I do? There's just a calmness that comes, I think, when you're preparing yourself every day, like the band did. If somebody falls in the front, then you're just trying to find your way back to what you need to do in this moment. That's why some of us can keep, not always, but you can begin to be calm in a circumstance. The sky is not always falling. And sometimes we take turns doing that. But here we see that Daniel, what does Daniel do in verse 17? Those of you who have the Bible, just, he went where? To his house. And what did he do? Evidently, who was there? His buddies. Okay. His buddies were there. And then it it said, he asked them in verse 18, that they would request compassion from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that Daniel and his friends might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. So they're together praying, asking God to give Daniel the wisdom to know what the dream was because that wasn't too hard for him. But I like how the New American Standard says it, that they might request compassion from God. They're not demanding that God give them the answer because they have established, you know, a name for themselves in his name. And, you know, you see where I'm going? Lord, we have a great ministry for you here. You've got to help us because we will continue your ministry. No, it's like, God, give us, you have compassion on us. I bet they prayed. But it's not the first time. Remember, these are still young guys. And so my question is, is would your friends do the same? Do you have a group where you go and you're able to call up and say, okay, I need the the prayer squad, you know, the V team, the P team. (laughs) And thank you for your gifts, those of you who have been so kind. Somebody gave me a little metal V for my V team popcorn, caramel corn, and a little pad to draw on. I mean, just fun toys. Thank you very much. But I think it's pretty important, and it's not for you to, you know, belittle your friends, but you also need to be the person when people come and say, I I would like for you to pray about something, I would encourage you to pray right then. Well, let's just, let me just pray for you. 
You know, try to get in that habit of, of just praying for it. And, and, and if it's not convenient or in good taste or whatever, I put that in quotes, to pray out loud, you can just put your hand on them and pray. And, and just say, you know, may the Lord bless you. Whatever God would have you to say, but you are his emissary. He is in you. So you're a concrete pipe. He flows through you. That's what I saw in that Corey Ten Boom program. I saw she was a concrete pipe, and, and God flowed through her. In the last chapter of the book, The Hiding Place, she talks about going back to Germany, where she swore she would never go. She was speaking at an event, and after the event, one of the ex-guards from her prison camp came up. And something like, you know, God's grace covers us all, doesn't it, Fraulein, or something along those lines. And, and I thought, I put myself in her position, and I thought, I would have come over the podium and attacked the person. Because I think this person had beat her sister. You know, her sister died. Betsy died there. And it was the first. See, when trauma happens to us, it is difficult to get over. Don't berate yourself or others when you're trying to get over trauma, because it takes a long time sometimes, because you're cut up on the inside. That was happened in your brain, and it takes time, you know, to get over that. And like tonight, not being able to think, well, this have to, if God doesn't come, we'll just close in prayer. You know what I'm saying? If, if he doesn't come, it won't be there. I, there. There's no way that you can do it unless God does it. That's the best place to be. Because when you just start picking it up and plowing the field all by yourself, you take the horses off the traces and you put it on yourself, it's not going to be the same. Because you can't be the horse and, and, and the person behind the horse at the same time. It's... Giddy up! It just doesn't work. That was for your benefit. That's what I'd have to do in seventh grade. I would have to. That's why you, I, you get, you're getting what I've done in teaching all these years. And then when the secret is revealed to Daniel, he blesses God and he says in verse 20, let the name of God be blessed forever and ever for wisdom and power belong to him. Guess what he's given back to God? Praise for what God has given him. And it is he who changes the times and the epochs. He removes kings and establishes kings. I don't hear any bitterness in this, do you? He gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to men of understanding. It is he who reveals the profound and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. I love talking about light. I love light. I love the light when it comes through the window. I love the light when it dapples the leaves. I'll, tell, I'll take a thousand pictures of the sunset. They all look the same. But in the moment, they looked a little different. You know, just because how it turns or how it does or how it lights up one part. or, or It's just like it's... In, I, don't, I know it's scary. But in my brain, it's just like, that is so cool. And in, in Psalm 139, it says, Even the darkness is not dark to thee, O Lord. It's like light. And so he says, you know what, what's in the darkness and the light dwells with you. To thee, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise. For thou hast given me wisdom and power. Even now thou hast made known to me what we requested of thee. For thou hast made known to us the king's matter. That's, that's amazing. So when he goes to the king, well, he goes to, the, to Arioch. And he, and he says, don't, don't kill the wise men of Babylon. Now, if I had been him, I would have let him kill them all because they had been a pain in his side because he's not even a Babylonian. I mean, don't you know there's jealousy? I mean, because he's risen up in the ranks. And it's not going to be the last time. If he had killed them then, he probably wouldn't have been thrown in the lion's den later on. But he doesn't. He says, have mercy. Do not kill them. See, it's just not about us as Christians. It's about people who don't know Jesus, that we show compassion and love because every moment a person has to live, there's another opportunity for them to hear from the Lord. The meanest person in your neighborhood whose dog comes and poops on your yard and kicks over your garbage, and, and you, ha you got to love those people because God has placed you there that you would hate them so he would have to change your heart so you would have to start beginning to say I pray for those people let me love those people because if you can't love those people you're not going to be able to love anybody else starts right dadgum there 
Love your dog. Don't mind cleaning up after him. Sometimes you just have to walk in that. So you can understand, this is not just some, oh, glorious morning, it's a glorious morning, kumbaya, Lord, kumbaya, peace on earth, and let it begin with me. I mean, it's not just one long, whatever you call that, putting together songs. It's real life. Poop on the ground. Oh, that we would just think to glorify God in the moment. And you know what? You're going to start getting tired when you start turning your attention to him and everything. Because it's going to be using your brain. You're going to be more present than you've ever been before. You're not going to go on autopilot. You're not going to go somewhere else. You're going to remain in the moment. So you can recognize and be on the alert. Just like, you know, God was talking to you like, you know, one day I was, I was coming home from something and it was like, you know, go to Pizza Hut or something like that. And I'm like, I don't like Pizza Hut. I don't want to go to Pizza Hut. It's this voice in my head. I know that sounds strange, but just a thought. I don't hear an audible voice. And, and it's like, go to Pizza Hut. No, go to Pizza Hut. No, I don't want to go to Pizza Hut. And I'm driving. I'm like, I don't want to go to Pizza Hut. I'm on a diet. If you would just let me lose weight, I could go to Pizza Hut. <laughs> so finally I just said, I'm going to Pizza Hut. Okay. So I pull into Pizza Hut. I go in there and it's like, here I am. I'm at Pizza Hut. And right across the way, the moment I walked in the door was a lady who was coming to my Bible study at church. And I looked at her and she looked at me. She said, oh, but I've been trying to get with you. And I went, yeah, I'm at Pizza Hut. <laughs> I didn't even eat. She had already finished. I just sat down. We were able to visit. And I went home and had my salad. You know, it's just like God tries to direct us. But we don't recognize that. We just think it's this, this thing that's bothering us in the back of our head. And, and, and learning to listen to that little voice is where your life begins to change and he begins to direct you in a more open way and your relationship with him changes. Because all of a sudden, you're not just yourself trying to serve God. You're with him. He's with you. Now, is all of it wonderful? No. You know, where you're trying to bring yourself just to, to, to not scream out in pain or, or in agony or whatever. It's not that you go, oh, I'm just going to praise God in this moment. You, scream, whatever you need to do. He is with you. He understands. You have to be who you are, where you are, and take the time that God gives you. Crying out to Him. So Daniel comes before the king in 27. And I, I was profoundly moved by what he said. I, I, I wrote down and I thought, oh, Lord, gosh, this is so good. And Daniel answered before the king and said in verse 27, as for the mystery about which the king has inquired, neither wise men, conjurers, magicians, nor diviners are able to declare it to the king. He pretty much listed off all the rowdy crowd. The people you've been dependent on, they can't do that. He didn't go there, a bunch of doofuses. He just said, these people, he just said what was true. Though they have not been able to tell you this dream. However, he didn't go, I can't. <laughs> However, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will take place in the latter days. This was your dream and the visions in your mind while on your bed. He says to the king, God revealed to you what's to come. You got the wisdom. Well, he's not saying you're whatever, you're a bad king or we hate you or you're going to kill all. He is saying to him, because God has allowed him to be there. He's given you the information. 
For you, king, while on your bed, your thoughts turn to what would take place in the future. And he who reveals mysteries has made known to you what will take place. But as for me, this mystery has not been revealed to me for any wisdom residing in me more than any other living man, but for the purpose of making the interpretation known to the king and that you may understand the thoughts of your mind. Do you hear him saying, you need to come to Jesus, let's pray? No, he says, the God the li- has revealed it to you so you will know what you're to do in the coming days. He has given you reconnaissance information. He's given you wisdom. He's given you knowledge. And I thought, that is brilliant. But how hard is it to come before someone with that wise, tactful, talking to the person and encouraging them in their leadership. I, I was in a difficult place, and, and I, I wanted to tell the people, you know, what I what I thought about some things, and, and I just felt like it, it, they didn't want to know. And it wasn't like, you know, tell them all everything. It's just some, some things I'd observed. And, and I'd been praying. I, you know, had a meeting with them, and I'd been praying about it, praying about it, because I really wanted God to be in charge of that. And so before I went, God said, I want you to paint them. I'm just, you know, I'm kind of doing these little cards and giving them to them and then say, just try to find something in this picture. I don't know what it is, but here. If you look at it long enough, it'll look like something, I'm sure. Like looking up at the clouds. And, uh, and, and he said, I want you to thank them for what they're doing. And I want you to give them these cards that you've painted. You know, of course, one of them I think liked it and one of them didn't. And um, thank them for what they've done. And, uh, and you appreciate that. I felt so free. I was able to... Th- and it wasn't that I didn't think they'd need it. It was just like I was able to go and encourage some people who needed to be encouraged. And to lift them up, pray for them, give them prizes. It's hard to resist love. It's hard to resist gratitude. It's hard to resist prizes. You know, sometimes it just takes a little effort. When my zinnias bloom, I try to stop down in the front, clip off four or five or six, and if I'm going to the bank, I put it in there with my money. And there goes the little zinnia through the tube. (laughs) Go to Walmart, put it right on the cash register. You know, just give them out. Just... You know, that's for you. And I feel a little silly sometimes. You know, like, hey, this is for you. <laughs> you know, like a doofus or whatever. But I felt like God said, you know, and I would have quite a few. And then it, I wouldn't give it to everybody. But, you know, when I felt like he was giving it to me, it's like, oh, I feel so silly. It is God who is giving that to that person. And so he comes and, and he talks about the king's dream and it goes through. And we're not going to talk about the king's dream. There have been millions and millions of pages written about that. And then how many people are not familiar with the story of his three friends and their Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego with their new names? You know, we call Daniel Daniel, but we call them by their new names. Isn't that funny? Yeah. They're known throughout all of history by their new names. And I thought that was just really interesting. You know, that, that we call Daniel Daniel, but he was Belshazzar. But we don't call him that. But we call Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego um, the Beatles or something like that. Um, and how many people don't know the story about them going in, into the fiery furnace? That's what Christians call the fire. It, please, if, if you haven't heard it, I, I would really like to know. Okay, everybody's heard it. So you know what happened. Um, the king raises up an image of gold. And it doesn't... I think in every generation it changes what it is. Uh, you may have put one up in your yard. You know, that that's... Don't touch it. You know, that's the you know, most important thing. And remember the most important thing in your house are the people who live in it and come to visit it. But it's hard when they break something. It's hard to remember that they're not the treasures, especially when you've got a house like mine. I've just got antiques everywhere. Of course, they already look broken anyway, so that's all I can afford. It has a chip out of it or I lost something gone. Yeah, what it would look like if it were here is as far as... But they said they're not going to bow down. And 
his name was Keith, Keith Green. Remember Keith Green, those of you? Uh, a singer who died with a couple, a couple of three of his kids in a plane crash. He was back in the 60s and 70s, just one of the pioneers of Christian music at that time. One of his, one of his uh, album covers was So You Want to Go Back to Egypt was on that, that particular one. But it had an artistic rendition of everyone bowing down and three men standing. Thousands of people bowed down. It's pretty obvious when you're standing and everyone else is bowed down. And we, yet, we see that Daniel is not the only one. So don't be discouraged if you're not Daniel. You're not even known by your regular name. But it's better than the women in the Bible, the woman who was formerly a prostitute. I would like to be known as different than that. How about you? I made the Bible, <laughs> but I'm known forever as the f- woman who was formerly a prostitute. <laughs> or how about the man born blind? I mean, he never forgets the one who's healed. I would really like for y'all to call me the man who was healed instead of the man who was born blind. <laughs> The former prostitute. I'm just sick and tired of y'all calling me that, boys. I can't you see him. I, mean, I, just, I love just thinking of the, about the backstory. Um, <laughs> the Bible really pops up off the page if you spend enough time with it and really look at it like real life instead of just words. I mean, it, you know, it just stands right up. And so here they come, and and he, you know, certain Jews... People are always stirring up trouble. Certain Jews won't bow down. Uh, they won't, you know, they won't do what you have told them to do. And and so we're going to give them another chance. I'm going to give you another chance. And when all these things play, you're going to fall down. And let's look at what they said. Do we have that? Oh, I have the clicker now. Yep, there it is. Oh, we won't let that us bother us. I didn't type it in there. I didn't put it on there. It's mine, not theirs. Okay, look at verse 15. Those of you who have Bibles, and if you want to share with somebody, you know, no forced sharing here, no forced reading. But uh, look at the words that he says. And I want to tell you, based on what we're talking about today, based on what you have on the handouts that I gave you and the statistics that I gave you and the things that I wrote in there, if you want to, if you want to read them, when you look at that, that's where we're going is what this is being said in America today. I mean, it's basically the present day world. Okay. And, and this is what he says in, in the last part of 15. But if you will not worship, you will immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. And here it goes. And what God, little g, what little g God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? What God is there who can do? I mean, he's won everything he's, he's gone up against. I mean, God's given victory. So he's thinking, hey, who can deliver you out of my hands? Y'all going to die. Well, he, they can die. And I, it's just amazing what they say to him. Once again, you see these are men who have prepared themselves for this time. And God gives them the ability. Were they, were they not afraid? Were they not quaking? I'm sure they were. You know, we look at these guys as if they're not flesh and blood. Try to think of your sons, if you have sons or children. Try to think of your children. Try to think of your husband. Try to think of yourself being in that position. Some of the teenagers that you know right now, if you know any teenager, just try to put one in your mind and think, can I imagine that guy, that girl, standing in front of King Nebuchadnezzar, if you've done any study of history, and say to them, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this. I mean, you're in the crowd and you're like, wow, that's not a good lead in. 
<laughs> you know, you need a little more tact. You know, Daniel, your buddy, he's got tact. I mean, I can just hear the Jewish mothers. Ay, why are you? Ay, oh. <laughs> Look at verse 17. They're pretty clear here. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. And basically that means by death or by life. But even if he does not, even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king. See, they don't... O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you've set up. I've had to look at stuff in my life and ask God, what, has, what have I set up in my life um, that would be... I would be tempted to serve... And I would say part of it would be reputation. You know, in loss of reputation, reputation, especially when you, you know, get a certain age, you think, well, I mean, what am I going to do now? I mean, you lose your good name and, it, and what, you need to bow down to that. You need to submit, you, you need to, you need to work real hard so people you know, will not know you as the woman formerly who was a prostitute or who messed up or, you know, the way we talk about people. Well, you know the story about her, don't you? Just never goes away. And uh, you, you can live in that and say, that's just going to be the, the focus of my life. Or I'm going to say, well, you know, all I know is that God can deliver me from this situation. God can show me what to do because I'm, I'm before him. I'm standing before him. If I've seen something wrong, if I've done something, it, he will show me as I come to him. That's what you have to believe. And when he reveals to you that you've been arrogant when you didn't even know you were arrogant, you thought you were broken. Well, you've really been arrogant in this. Well, shoot, it, I didn't know that. I mean, Wow. And you didn't speak kindly to this person. Well, they were really ugly to me, you know, when you start doing that. But they were really to God. You need to catch yourself and say, ah, oh, there's sin in my life in there. There are things in my life that are really breaking down my spiritual metabolism. Making me weak. Not strong. And we have such an image in our minds today of what we're supposed to look like. But we don't take care of ourselves. We don't take care of ourselves physically or, or mentally or emotionally. There's just something about it that there's a disconnect that we have about really focusing on how we are to live life. And that every moment is a choice. And that you're supposed to get up and you're supposed to have the best clothes. I was with a speaker one time and, and, and her rule of thumb is that she dresses one, I forget how she said it, one, one level above her audience. I'm like, they're levels? <laughs> I mean, you notice what people wear in your audience? You know, and I, I would never get it. I mean, I have a scarf that I bought back in the room and, and, and I took the out of the package and it's like a tube. I mean, it's like sewn together. It's not like a lot. I'll bring it tomorrow. Y'all can show me how I'm supposed to wear it. I mean, I was trying to, I was trying to put it on today and I'm like, I, I, I'm like, I don't get this. I, I, I mean, if, if I'm, I'm just not wired that way. It's just like, I've never have been. It's like, sometimes I'm at Walmart and I think, uh, Walmart, and I'm like, did I sleep in these clothes? And, <laughs> you know, did I put a bra on? <laughs> and that's when you're standing at checkout. You know, you've been there. You've been there the whole time, you know, just walking around the store. Oh, we want to be known as women who love the Lord. She knew God. Wouldn't that be the best thing? 
you know, and they talk about you. She knew God, and she wanted us to know God, and, and her heart was, you know, you don't want them to say she was mean as a snake. <laughs> Some of you here are mean as snakes. I mean, you know, sometimes we think that's our only defense. We're just mean. You know, and, and, and we have to work on that. I mean, sarcasm, I used to be really good at it till somebody pointed out that sarcasm is, is, is being funny at someone else's expense. And sometimes it's funny, but it's just all ragged on the edges. And I realized that's not somewhere I need to go. You know, beginning to realize that everything has a consequence. What is your motive? What is your meaning? Are you more concerned with who God has you with? And, and that doesn't mean if you're dying inside that you're, you know, Miss Mary Poppins or, well, she was pretty powerful, wasn't she? Uh, it was a, sugar, let's uh, <laughs> But... I always thought she should have dated Bert. I don't know why they didn't. <laughs> that just always bothered me. Didn't it bother you? It's kind of like she thought he was below her or something. But see, you can even look at Mary Poppins and go, she had problems. I mean, there was stuff in her life. She was a little, you know, haughty or whatever. And But I think my, my point is, is that when we look at these people, and we're going to look at Paul in the morning, I mean, you from the get-go, when you realize from the get-go, your purpose is to love the Lord and love others. I mean, well, however he does that, whether you rise to the top of a foreign country. I mean, we can't even imagine that as Americans. I mean, we're just like, I mean, we can imagine it better now than we ever have, I think. Well, even in the wars, though, when they were afraid that there would be attacks from, you know, our, our oceans or whatever. But nowadays, you don't even know if your supermarket's going to blow up from somebody from another place. See, it's not the world we used to have. But our practices form us. Our processes form us. You see that time and time again in the Word. And we want to be those kind of people. And if you're here and, and, and you are a seeker and you're, you're saying, you know, I, I, I didn't know this Jesus. I, or, or you've been, you're here and you've known, known the Lord all your life. But it's, it's like a, a foreign relationship. You know, it's like somebody, a cousin who lives in another place. Or you got married and he lives in, you know, one state and you live in another. And you never really see him. There's no, there's no relationship. There's no understanding that you say, I do to Jesus. You, you weren't born this way. You, you don't, you're not born into marriage. You have to, you know, say something. And I think it's the same way when we, we start a relationship with the Lord. I was a Christian at five years old. But at 23, I realized that I was a concrete pipe and God had to flow through me. Because that's what he did to Corey. When that man said that to her, she said, she, he put out his hand and she couldn't shake his hand. Because she was so racked with anger and hatred for him. She'd just been talking about God's love up on the podium. But here down in the ranks, faced with the evil that she had lived with, what is she going to do? And she said to God, I can't love him. I can't forgive him. I can't even take his hand. God honest. And then you're going to have to do it. And I think she prayed like three or four times. You know, in the South, if someone had stuck his hand out, I would have just shaked, you know, hated him the whole time. But probably, you know what I'm saying? You're, you're socially, you're, you're, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, brother. You know, but there was something in her that said, I can't. God, you're going to have to do it through me. And, you know, Corey said, all of a sudden she felt like, you know, warmth came through her head and down her arm. And she said she just didn't have... Uh, uh, forgiveness for the man, she was overwhelmed with love for the man. Weird, hooey dooey, how does that happen? And she said, Yes, brother, he does. 
And a girl was reading that and she said, I closed the book and I said, a concrete pipe, that's all God wants us to be, is a concrete pipe. He puts us where he wants us to be. He flows through us what he wants. We can't manufacture it. We can't cap our ends. We can't even clean out our pipes. We have to rotor rooter our pipes. First John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if you've not talked to him in a while about what you need to ask forgiveness for, you're a little behind Because every day our hearts trip. And it causes a little separation. Not that he's away from us, but just something in your heart where, even if you don't recognize it, to say, Lord, is there something I've done, you know, that I need to get clear with you? So we're going to pray. And if, if anyone wants to give their heart to Jesus, it's not that you say words with me and you don't have to do it here. But I do think there needs to be a time where you can point to to say, I said I do then. I may have said it before, but that's the last time I'm getting married and I'm married to the Lord. And, and, and we're, I'm gonna, we're gonna, if you come up and, and play and, and we're, I'm, we're gonna pray and, and, um, just spend a little time, um, in that. That's something you need to pray about, give to Jesus. It's, it's not that I'm asking you to make some sort of, um, show here that's not what i'm talking about but but as i pray and you pray and and you have your head still bowed then i'm going to ask you if you made a decision to raise your hand and i'm and to find my eyes and i'm going to just pray a little blessing over you so god you will know that that you have been prayed over and 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 if you have to leave you go ahead and do that um you know if it's just us and the band up here we'll we'll just jam to bunko i guess um (laughs) Except you, you can't go to Bunko. Um, so let's pray and let's do business with God if we need to tonight. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to come and to laugh, but also talk about serious stuff, about stuff that, that haunts us, that bothers us, that ticks us off and, and, and makes us fall or, or is eating our guts out or, or we have no joy. We're so burdened. We're so grieved. We can't, breathe, we can't even breathe, Lord. But we just want to say, in this day, I try to give that to you. I just wrap up all that in a ball, in a, in a piece of cloth, and I, I put a string around it, and I put it in front of your throne, and I say, I give that to you. Just take that. Thank you that you're God and I'm not. And, and I just acknowledge that. If I can't feel it in my heart, I say it with my mind. I say it with my mouth. I give you all my lack, and I take back your abundance. And if there, if there are those of you here who've never given your heart to Jesus or you don't know that you have and you want tonight to be the stake in the ground with us, if, if you would just pray this prayer, something along these lines, Dear Heavenly Father, I, I know that I need a Savior. I know I have fallen short. I, I know that there's something missing in my life. And I, I want to say I do to Jesus. I, I say that He is your provision for my going to heaven, for my being connected with you, and that you will live through me in this life. And I give you myself the best I know how. And with your head still bowed, if you prayed that prayer, if you would just raise your hand and catch my eye so I can pray over you. It's okay if nobody did, but if you did, I bless you in the name of Jesus. And I say, welcome to the kingdom. And I say that the Lord is with you. He goes before you, behind you, and he covers you with his hand. And he will be with you in this new journey, my new sister in Christ. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Someone else? Anyone else? I bless you in the name of Jesus, my new sister in Christ. And I welcome you to the kingdom. And I say that you don't have to be God. He's God. And that he loves you. He has plans for you. But he wants you to know you're safe with him. And I bless you in the name of Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Someone else? If y'all see anybody and I miss them, y'all help me. Anyone else? There's a, a hand on this side. Ben? If you got your hand raised and I've not recognized you, would you let me see your hand again? I bless you in the name of the Jesus. I see two of you right there. Welcome to the kingdom. And I just bless you and say that the Lord is your strength. He's your, your redeemer. He is the one who, who 
has the strength and the power to teach you and direct you and lead you and heal you. I pray that God would bring people in your life to show you exactly what you need to know in your growth at this point in your life. And I'm, I rejoice as the angels are rejoicing in heaven right now. And I bless you in the name of Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I see you in the back. I bless you in the name of Jesus. Welcome to the kingdom. And I say that the Lord is your shepherd. You shall not want. He leads you in pastures by by cool waters. And he's going to restore your soul. And that he will walk with you in the valley of death. And you will fear no evil. For your God is with you. Because you are no longer outside in the darkness. You are now in the family. And of the light. And for the light. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I bless you in the name of Jesus, my new sister in Christ. And I pray that you know that he absolutely understands where you are. And he's called you and he's wooed you. And I pray that you would know that this is a one-time decision. He knows who you are. He takes you as you are. And he knows where you're going. So I bless your new flight. I bless your new journey. And I say it in the name of Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Someone else? Somebody over here? Oh, I see you. Welcome to the kingdom, my new sister in the Lord. I pray that you would unequivocally know, without a a modicum of doubt, that there's been a transaction between you and the God of the universe tonight, and that he already knew you were going to do this. He wooed you and drew you to this place and opened your heart and opened your eyes to say, Baby, come here. Come here with me. So I don't know what God has in store, but I do know that there's victory in Jesus. I do know there's power in the blood. And I do know there's peace like a river. And I pray those things over you tonight. And I I welcome you and bless you. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Someone else?